Welcome to the lecture entitled, The Classical View of Scientific Theories. I'm Andrew Chapman. In this lecture, we'll discuss eight topics. One, the broad definition of theory and what theories do. Two, logical positivism and the classical view of theories. Three, the three components of a scientific theory. Four, abstract structure, definitions, and meaningful statements. Five, correspondence rules, the empirical and the theoretical. Six, an interpretation of a scientific theory. Seven, scientific progress and scientific methodology. And eight, critical analysis of the classical view. If we understand how science is generally practiced, the issues of demarcation, methodology, and progress, and the issues of explanation, prediction, and understanding, we might wonder what more there is to understand about the nature of science. While all of those issues are important to science, they're largely important precisely because of their relations to scientific theorizing, that is, the creation, testing, acceptance, improvement, and abandonment of scientific theories. Thus, to understand science is to understand scientific theories, and to understand scientific theories is to understand science. We can learn how science is and ought to be practiced by examining scientific theorizing, and we can see whether scientists are behaving maximally rationally by looking at how they actually interact with scientific theories. The central goal of science is to promote understanding of the natural world, and this understanding is achieved via explanations of natural phenomena, and these explanations further allow for predictions of future phenomena. Thus, scientific theories are large-scale explanations of phenomena in general. Theories are sets of sentences and are created by scientists. However, theories are only true, and hence only accurately explain the world, if they correctly describe reality as it actually is, apart from anyone's mere beliefs about reality. The goal of scientific theorizing, then, is to create theories that accurately describe the widest range of phenomena using as few explanatory facts as possible. Logical positivism, which is sometimes called logical empiricism, although the latter is technically a separate position, was a philosophical school founded in Berlin and Vienna in the 1920s. The goal of the positivists was to place philosophy on the secure path of a science. Much of the philosophy of science comes from logical positivism's interactions with science and philosophy and their relating of philosophy to science and science to philosophy. A central aim of positivism, in terms of placing philosophy on the secure path of a science, was to treat empirical science as the primary way of knowing about the world, and to treat philosophy as valuable, generally, in terms of philosophy's ability to aid in scientific investigations. Thus, most logical positivists were concerned with philosophy of science, philosophy of language, 
and logic, since they saw philosophy's ability to help science use terms and concepts precisely and clearly as one of philosophy's most valuable assets. The thought that the logical positivists had was that science could be even better if scientists were able to use concepts and terms clearly and precisely, and that philosophy could help scientists do this. Ernest Nagel is one of the founding members of logical positivism. His philosophical career focused primarily on the philosophy of science and on logic as it applied to the philosophy of science and science more generally. His most famous work is known as The Structure of Science, and much of his work concerning the philosophy of science deals with the overall structure of science, scientific theorizing, scientific hypotheses, how evidence relates to hypotheses and theories, how logic plays into this structure. So Nagel is concerned centrally with structure and its relationship to how scientists do behave and how scientists ought to behave. The standard idea of a scientific theory is that a theory accomplishes a number of important scientific goals that are all related to one another. Chief among these goals, one, the theory explains general phenomena, two, the theory unifies phenomena, explanations, and other theories with one another, three, the theory contains and addresses relevant empirical facts, things that can be observed through the senses, four, the theory contains and addresses relevant non-empirical facts, that is, facts concerning theoretical entities, non-empirical things that are required for theories to do the explanatory work that they do. Five, the theory can be employed in order to make scientific progress, and six, it can play a role in a correct scientific methodology. Once we recognize that the standard picture of theories is that they do these things, we can evaluate any conception of a scientific theory in terms of whether that conception of a scientific theory says that theories do these things and how it says theories do these things. Regularities in nature, natural laws, which are regularities that occur with necessity, scientific explanations, and scientific theories have a close relationship in the classical view of theories. Specific phenomena including regularities in nature, things that happen over and over again, are explained by showing that these phenomena had to happen given certain boundary conditions, that is, initial conditions, and the natural laws. What explains these phenomena is that they can be deduced from premises concerning boundary conditions and natural laws. This picture of scientific explanation is known as the deductive nomological model of scientific explanation, and it says that something is explained when it can be shown that that thing had to have happened, and that if we had all the facts, we would have expected that thing to happen. The classical view of scientific theories builds on and incorporates the deductive nomological model of scientific explanation. Sometimes this view of theories is even called the deductive nomological model or view of scientific theories. These natural laws that end up doing explanatory work of particular phenomena and regularities, 
themselves are then explained by showing that they are derivable from even broader laws, laws that take into account phenomena at a broader level of generality. This explaining laws in terms of broader laws is scientific theorizing, according to the classical view. And the connection between two levels of law is made by the scientific theory. So, individual phenomena are explained by scientific explanations, and the laws used in those scientific explanations are explained by even broader laws, and what does the explaining of one set of laws in terms of a broader set of laws is a scientific theory, according to the classical view. According to Nagel, scientific theories contain three components that work together to provide the sorts of explanations that scientific theories are supposed to provide. One, an abstract calculus that is the logical skeleton of the explanatory system and that implicitly defines the basic notions of the system. Two, a set of rules that in effect assign an empirical content to the abstract calculus by relating it to the concrete materials of observation and experiment. And three, an interpretation or model for the abstract calculus which supplies some flesh for the skeletal structure in terms of more or less familiar conceptual or visualizable materials. We'll look at each one of these components in turn and in depth. Now just because we've laid them out as one, two, three in a particular order, that doesn't mean that that order has anything to do with scientific theorizing. So all three of these are required for a scientific theory to do the sorts of things that it does. None of them is more important than any of the others, and it's not as though one of them comes first in time or in scientific theorizing. The abstract structure of a scientific theory, what Nagel also calls the abstract calculus, contains four necessary components. It contains logical terms. These are terms like and, or, not, if, then, etc., that don't mention the world but that provide the logical structure for claims about the world. The claims about the world couldn't be possible without these logical terms. So these things can be seen as the grease for the machine of making claims about the world. Non-logical empirical terms are the second necessary component. These are terms that refer to things that have empirical content, that can be experienced directly. Three, non-logical, non-empirical terms. These are terms that refer to things that have no empirical content, that can't be experienced directly. These are terms that refer to theoretical entities. If theoretical entities exist in the world, and everything we know about scientific theories shows us that they do, then the non-logical, non-empirical terms that are components of the abstract structure of a theory are the things that refer to them, or that are set up to refer to theoretical entities. And the fourth component of a scientific theory, of the abstract structure of a scientific theory, is specific internal relations between the components of the abstract structure. 
The abstract structure is a structure. It's not just a collection of terms. The terms are related to each other. The terms in the abstract structure are related to one another via relations of logical deducibility, such that specific claims with empirical content can be deduced from other components of the structure. Recall that, according to the classical view, explanation is a relation between premises and conclusion, where the conclusion is the thing to be explained, and the premises are the things that do the explaining. So the abstract structure needs to be in the form of premise-conclusion deducibility relations if this is going to be possible. Now the abstract structure of a scientific theory really is just a structure. No content is filled in yet. It's like you see the blueprints of a building, but there aren't any walls or floors or an actual building there yet. It's just the structure. And it is really abstract. In the abstract structural form, it's not yet even talking about the world. So on its own, the abstract structure can't do the theoretical explanatory work that scientific theories are supposed to do. The abstract structure of a scientific theory includes, as we've already noted, non-logical terms, both empirical and non-empirical, that might appear to you to have meanings on their own. However, no term as it appears in the abstract structure itself means anything at all within the abstract structure. Thus, even a term that you might think you understand the meaning of, so for example, molecule, is meaningless within the structure. It's best to think of the non-logical terms within the abstract structure as mere variables that are awaiting meanings. Now, of course, to use our example here, molecule, molecule does mean something, but it means something because it got its meaning from something outside of the abstract structure itself, and we'll discuss momentarily where the terms that come from the abstract structure get their meanings. When you're considering the abstract structure of a scientific theory on its own, without the other two components of a scientific theory, then what you're considering is a structural object with a whole bunch of nodes in it, and none of the nodes that are the terms of the theory have any meaning yet. Non-logical terms have what Nagel calls implicit definitions within the abstract structure. However, these implicit definitions show only the function of the term and the relation it has to other terms within the structure. In order to know what a term means in the world, an explicit definition is needed, and these explicit definitions don't exist within the abstract structure itself. So when you're looking at the abstract structure, you can see the terms and their relations to other terms within the structure, but you can't see their relation to objects in the world, which is why, within the abstract structure, terms don't have meaning. Now, understanding the role and the content of the abstract structure of a theory requires understanding this distinction between implicit and explicit definitions. And the abstract structure of a theory is the most difficult part of a theory to understand, and it's probably the case that the explicit-implicit definition distinction is the most difficult part of the abstract structure to understand. So once you get this, you've got the general picture. An explicit definition 
is what we would typically consider a definition. If someone asks for a definition, it's what Nagel is calling an explicit definition. It's showing the meaning of a term. Now, for a logical positivist like Nagel, showing the meaning of a term involves relating it directly to the empirical, since the logical positivists are hardcore empiricists. Think of this term-to-empirical definitional relation as tying the abstract structure of the theory to reality. An implicit definition, on the other hand, in the context of Nagel's view, shows a combination of the function of the term and the relation of the term to other terms within the abstract structure itself. So think of this term-to-structure implicit definitional relation as placing the term within the theory. If all you know is implicit definitions of terms, you don't have any idea what the terms actually mean in the actual world. You know how they function within the abstract structure of the theory, but nothing else. What you need is an explicit definition or set of explicit definitions that tie the terms to the world. Since terms within the abstract structure of the theory don't mean anything in the standard sense of meaning, combinations of those terms don't strictly form statements or sentences or propositions since statements have meanings and they make claims about the world. However, these combinations of terms within the abstract structure are primed to make claims about the world once their constituent terms are explicitly defined by tying the terms to the world. These combinations of terms within the abstract structure of a theory before these terms are tied to the world are what Nagel calls statement forms, which is an apt term since they are in the form of statements but don't yet say anything about the world. Once the constituent terms of a statement form are explicitly defined, the statement form is no longer merely a form, since now it's connected to reality via the explicit definitions of its terms. Now, it is a form plus meaningful things. Once the constituent terms of a statement form have been explicitly defined, the statement form becomes an actual statement, a thing with meaning that makes claims about the world. So how is it that we can move from abstract structure of a theory to statements that make claims about the world via this sort of explicit definition? How does all that work? Correspondence rules, which are also called coordinating definitions and operational definitions and semantical rules and epistemic correlations and rules of interpretation, are the second component of any scientific theory. The first component is the abstract structure. The second is the correspondence rules. These rules are what connect the terms of the abstract structure of a theory to the world via explicit definitions. So these things that do this connecting are rules that show how terms correspond to the empirical, and that is how we get the term correspondence rules. Correspondence rules come in two varieties. There are those for non-logical empirical terms, and there are those for non-logical non-empirical terms, where non-logical non-empirical terms are terms that refer to theoretical entities. And strictly speaking, according to Nagel, the logical terms like and and or 
don't mean anything at all. They're just the grease that allows us to say things about the world. The correspondence rules for non-logical empirical terms relate a term to some empirical situation in which the thing the term refers to is present. The correspondence rules for non-logical non-empirical terms relate a term to some empirical situation in which related empirical things are present. Nagel's view here is an attempt to make sense of scientific theories purely empirically. He's a positivist, and so he thinks that the only things that can be known are things that are known via the empirical. Thus, all correspondence relations, all correspondence rules, need to relate a term to some empirical situation. Now, when a term refers to something that can be experienced, this relating between term and thing is straightforward. So, for example, dog is related to this thing right here. Point at the dog. A dog is an empirical object. However, when a term refers to something that cannot be experienced, namely a theoretical entity, that term must still be tied to the empirical somehow, according to Nagel. We can't just say, well, the term refers to something non-empirical, and that's all there is to it. The term can't get its meaning unless we relate it to the empirical. Thus, we tie the term to empirical circumstances that are surrounding the theoretical entity. So, for example, falling objects could be related to the term gravity, since gravity can't be directly experienced, it can only be indirectly experienced. So, we say that the term gravity means the thing that's going on here, and then we talk about the empirical situation of things that are unsupported falling. The third component of any scientific theory is an interpretation of that theory. The term interpretation is used in the current context to refer to a set of statements that is the result of explicitly defining the statement forms of some abstract collection of merely implicitly defined terms. Thus, an interpretation of a theory is the result of applying correspondence rules to all of the non-logical terms that are components of the abstract structure of the theory. An interpretation is the fully filled in empirically comprehensive face of the theory. Interpretations are what we generally think of when we think of a scientific theory. However, Strictly speaking, the interpretation is simply a useful tool that allows scientists to make use of the theory without having to engage in laborious translations from the abstract to the empirical every time they want to explain something in terms of a theory. So think about some scientific theory gravitational theory, or evolutionary theory. When you think about that theory, and you use the terms of that theory, what you're using is an interpretation. That's what you're thinking about and talking about. But, says Nagel, your ability to do all of that relies on an underlying abstract structure and correspondence rules that relate the implicitly defined terms of the abstract structure to the empirical so that you can understand it by relating it to 
situations of observation or of experimentation. An example of an interpretation from Nagel. Nagel says, but how is the Bohr theory brought into relation with what can be observed in the laboratory? On the face of it, the electrons, their circulation in orbits, their jumps from orbits to orbits, and so on, are all conceptions that do not apply to anything manifestly observable. Connections must therefore be introduced between such theoretical notions and what can be identified by way of laboratory procedures. In point of fact, Connections of this sort are instituted somewhat as follows. On the basis of the electromagnetic theory of light, a line in the spectrum of an element is associated with an electromagnetic wave whose length can be calculated in accordance with the assumptions of the theory from experimental data on the position of the spectral line. On the other hand, the Bohr theory associates the wavelength of a light ray emitted by an atom with the jump of an electron from one of its permissible orbits to another such orbit. In consequence, the theoretical notion of an electron jump is linked to the experimental notion of a spectral line. Once this and other similar correspondences are introduced, the experimental laws concerning the series of lines occurring in the spectrum of an element can be deduced from the theoretical assumptions about the transitions of electrons from their permissible orbits. So, as Nagel is noting here, many of the components of this theory are theoretical in nature in that they involve terms that are non-logical, non-empirical terms, terms that don't have any direct empirical consequences. However, those terms are related to empirical things that aren't strictly what the terms are referring to, but that show up when the thing that the term is actually referring to is in the area. So, some particular result that shows on a measuring device in an experiment is correlated with some non-empirical term such that that particular empirical result in an experiment is what tells us that the theoretical, the non-observational, non-empirical term is correctly applied in that case. Once we have turned all of the terms from our abstract structure of a scientific theory into empirically relevant terms via correspondence rules, explicit definitions, then we have an interpretation, the sort of thing that scientists deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So in summation, the three components of a theory work together to allow the theory to do the work that theories are supposed to do. The abstract structure is the heart of the theory that relates all of the terms of the theory to one another such that the theory is able to explain empirical phenomena by deriving those phenomena from other components of the theory. However, within the abstract structure itself, none of the terms relate to the empirical world, the thing that we're trying to explain via the theory. This relating of abstract structure to empirical world is done via correspondence rules that explicitly define both empirical and theoretical terms in terms of possible empirical experience. And scientists make use of a theory via an interpretation of the abstract structure of the theory. 
An interpretation is the result of applying correspondence rules to the structure of the theory in order to get statements that are fully meaningful and empirically relevant. Successful scientific theorizing is the explaining of some scientific explanation in terms of more general laws. This is what Nagel's view says, and this more general explaining comes in the form of deriving the less general, the more specific laws, from the more general or less specific laws. This picture of successful scientific theorizing also supplies us with a picture of scientific progress and a methodology for successful scientific practice. Science progresses, according to the classical view, when the less general can be derived from the more general. When the less general can be explained in terms of the more general. Thus, the ultimate goal of science is to find the most general laws that describe the natural world and from which less general laws can be derived. Consequently, the goal of scientists should be to discover laws and develop theories that increasingly broaden the phenomena that science can account for. A standard picture of scientific method and scientific progress is that what scientists are aiming at is a theory of everything, one general set of laws that can explain everything that happens in the natural world. Now, we might need to use more specific laws in particular circumstances, but those specific laws aren't unrelated to the overall laws, according to the classical view, the relation of the specific laws to the more general laws is that the specific gets derived from the general, and thus the general explains the specific in this way. At the beginning of the lecture, we looked at a number of things that scientific theories attempt to do, or a number of things that seem to be components of a standard picture of scientific theory. So let's take a look at the classical view in terms of these things that a scientific theory ought to do. Well, the classical view explains less general phenomena by deriving them from more general phenomena, so it is explanatory. It unifies apparently disparate, less general phenomena by showing how they're derivable from more general phenomena, so it's unificatory. It accounts for the empirical by directly relating terms in the abstract structure of the theory to their empirical reference, so it makes sense of empirical facts. It accounts for the non-empirical, that is, the theoretical, by indirectly relating terms in the abstract structure of the theory to their non-empirical reference via surrounding empirical circumstances, so it can make sense of theoretical entities. It accounts for scientific progress by claiming that discovering ways to deduce the less general from the more general is how progress is made. And it accounts for scientific methodology by claiming that scientists ought to discover ways to deduce the less general from the more general. So, in terms of our standard picture of what a scientific theory ought to do, it seems as though the classical view looks pretty good. In looking at the classical view, we should recognize not only its apparent successes, but also ask ourselves where there is room for improvement. 
when in science or philosophy or any investigative discipline it seems as though we've made some success we shouldn't stop we should say is this as far as we can go and one way of asking that question is how might we improve the picture that we've gotten some success with so here are a few questions that we might ask ourselves in order to start such a critical analysis of the classical view This is supposed to be a prescriptive model of science in that it tells us how scientific theories ought to be formed and used. It also tells us what progress looks like and how scientists ought to behave in order to make progress. Now we can ask ourselves, are the prescriptions given to us by the classical view plausible? Is this really what scientific theories ought to be doing, and is it possible for scientific theories to do the things that the classical view says scientific theories should do? And further, do the prescriptions given to us by the classical view match how scientists actually think about and use theories? Now, it might be the case that scientists are just completely wrong about scientific theories, although it probably isn't, given how successful science has been. So, if we're going to give scientists a series of methodologies and say these are the things that make science successful, it's probably a good idea if those things have some relation to what scientists are already up to. The classical view is what's known as an ahistorical model of science in that it tells us that where theories came from, their history, their surrounding circumstances, is irrelevant to practicing good science. Now this is just a picture that positivists and a number of scientists have had of what science is supposed to be, that science objectively interacts with the world, and it doesn't matter who does the science or when they do the science, it will all be the same so long as they are doing science. However, is such an ahistorical view of scientific theories plausible? Or instead, do we actually need to look at the history of a theory, the history of the concepts used in a theory, in order to figure out what's going on in a scientific theory? And finally, this is supposed to be a version of empiricism concerning scientific theorizing. Empiricism, of course, is the view that the only justification or knowledge that we can have comes through the senses. Well, is this actually a version of empiricism? If it isn't a view of empiricism, that might be okay, but is it something that will be accepted by the people who are putting it forward? If it is an empiricist picture of theories? Can it actually account for the non-empirical elements of those theories in the indirect way it claims? That indirect reference picture, how the terms that are supposed to refer to theoretical entities do that referring, is pretty complicated. Does that actually make sense of how terms in theories refer to theoretical entities in theories. In this lecture, we've examined eight topics. One, the broad definition of theory and what theories do. Two, logical positivism and the classical view of theories. Three, the three components of a scientific theory. Four, abstract structure, definitions, and meaningful statements. Five, correspondence rules, the empirical and the theoretical. Six, an interpretation of a scientific theory. Seven, scientific progress and scientific methodology, and eight, critical analysis of the classical view.
Thank you.